So uh, first and foremost, uh, this is a part of our Friar Ties series, our totally interactive engagement series, and we're really excited um, to have our guest here tonight um, to take us through this admissions presentation. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of business before I get into our um, our introductions. So. Um, you guys can see us to all of our guests, um, but the way that we can interact with you is through either the chat. Um, the chat feature is open for everyone to see. Um, so that's actually usually where we see a lot of the, the go fryers or things like that. But if you have specific questions um, for us, uh, please utilize that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can throw any questions at us and we will definitely try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, throughout this presentation. Another just housekeeping thing, we are recording. Um, so if you have any Friar friends or family members who wanted to hop on but couldn't um, just for scheduling conflicts, we will be recording and are going to be able to share this following this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to just briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Marie Louie and I am an assistant director in alumni relations um, and I'm very excited to be going into my fifth year of working at PC after having graduated in 2014. Um, and along the lines of those five years, I've had the great privilege of uh, getting to collaborate with our two, um, two guests this evening who are joining me tonight. Um, first is Raul Fonts, who is the Associate Vice President, Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, going into his 21st year at PC. So, so grateful to you for joining us tonight. And also we have Amy Sembor, who is our Senior Associate Dean of Admissions, going into your ninth year, Amy, from, from what I know. So um, I think, you know, I can't thank you both enough for the work that you've done for PC. You and your team are definitely um, so instrumental in uh, bringing us the PC that we have today. So um, I know everybody wants to hear from you. So I'm going to turn it over to, to both of you and um, extremely grateful. So thank you. Thank you, Marie. Really appreciate the introduction. Um, welcome everyone uh, to this Friar Ties program. Um, and I know many of you are uh, graduates of Providence College. Uh, just so you know, Amy Sembor will be the producer tonight. She'll, she'll remind me of all the mistakes I made along the way um, and will give me the hook sign when I've gone way too long on any Never one happens. topic. She'll, she'll contain this. We want to get through this in a, in a pretty timely fashion because honestly, the best part of this, I'm going to call it a conversation, is you having the opportunity to ask us questions. Uh, I truly enjoy this presentation. I've given it many times over the years. I like, love talking to alums and talking about the admission process. Uh, certainly, I will miss tonight being in Ruane, being in the great room when we do this generally on a Saturday morning. Um, but in this in this environment, we're going to make the best of this, and we're going to um, we're going to have the best hour conversation we can possibly have. Um, Amy is going to man the controls. She's going to man the PowerPoint that we're about to put up. Um, Amy, do you want to add anything to our instructions to what they need to do? No, I don't think so, um, okay. Marie. You don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen here in a second. So as questions come in, um, if my screen is up, I'm in a technical, a different spot technically than I thought I would be. So if you don't mind when the questions come through, um, no problem. We, can, we can filter them through there. Gotcha. Great, Ready? fire away. All right. Okay. The only thing I'm going to add to Marie's introduction about me, uh, yes, this is my 21st year. Yes, I'm the Dean of Admission and Financial Aid. But probably my most important title um, for tonight's conversation is as parent of a current senior at Providence College, and maybe equally as important, parent of a high school senior who is going through the search process, through the application process, through the common app, through the essays, through supplemental essays and all of those other things. 
So when I say to you, I could be sitting in your seat tonight, I mean I could be sitting in your seat. I'm going to keep the jokes to a minimum tonight. Um, they're better said when we're in person, um, you know, and Amy doesn't like them anyway. So I'm going to, I'm going to, she's heard them too many times. She doesn't laugh. Um, so I'm going to keep that to a minimum and we're going to try to get through some of the introductory stuff pretty, pretty quickly. We use this, this uh, slideshow at a lot of our group information sessions and our high school visits. Um, this year, we're doing over 800 virtual high school visits. Um, so like many of you who are on virtual meetings throughout the day, we too are also on, on virtual visits to high schools. Um, and Amy, you can go to the next slide. We can get through the general information. Most of you know Providence College is a private Catholic liberal arts institution. We have 4,100 undergraduate students. Um, we have a 12 to one student to faculty ratio. You can see the male, female gender breakdown, 54% to 46%. And we have one of the highest retention rates. Actually, we're in the 5% you know, 5% bracket of institutions that have above a 90% retention rate. And 91 has been a staple for us. 91, 91 and a half, 92 um, is, is really incredible. It's one of the things that US News and World Report cites for us um, as one of our, you know, high water marks. There is your student to faculty ratio, 12 to one, average class size of 22 students, meaning you're still going to have the opportunity to interact with the other students in your class and interact with faculty. And I think that's really important. Faculty at PC are the heartbeat of the institution. They're going to work with your sons and daughters. They're going to interact with them on a regular basis. They're available during class to ask questions. They know when you're there and when you're not there. And they offer office hours throughout the week when you might need additional assistance or support. So it's still, while we're 4,100 undergrads, we're still a fairly um, small to medium-sized institution. This next slide talks about the core curriculum. Um, we are a liberal arts institution and 50% of a student's curriculum will be made up of core, core classes. And all of you as alums know the cornerstone of our curriculum is the development of Western civilization program. However, it's a little bit different than when you were at Providence College. Back in your day, it was five credits a semester for four semesters or 20 credits. That's what it was when I got to Providence College 21 years ago. It has now been um, revitalized. That's probably the best word to describe CIV. It's now four credits a semester, okay? Uh, it still goes in chronological order, so it will take you from Mesopotamia up to present day over your first three semesters. The big change, the big change is the fourth semester, and that is what we call the colloquium semester. It's a four-credit colloquium. It's team taught by two professors, and on the slide, you can see some of the topics that we had offered last spring. Every student gets to select their top two choices. Um, and I think of colloquium as the contemporary period. This is you know, pretty much you know, here and now, the summary of Western Civ. You can tell that by some of these topics, money, markets, and morality, the history of sports, which is one of the most popular uh, colloquium topics. There's always a waiting list to try to get into the history of sports. There's also a, 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 a sports analytics uh, colloquium, the apocalypse, race marginality and theology of liberation. That, I mean, there's some really unique and interesting colloquiums and they're all team taught by, different, by two different faculty members. So that's a little bit of the difference. Here's some st statistics, 60% of students participate in off-campus 
study, meaning they go abroad. Um, study abroad has grown in leaps and bounds over the last 10 years. Um, and it's grown primarily when we made the, the, the decision to allow um, need-based aid um, and scholarship to be portable. So in other words, any scholarship that a student receives or need-based aid that a student receives is applicable to a study abroad experience. Um, you're, you're paying the home institution and we pay the study abroad, the institution that the student studies at. And there are opportunities all over the world. Yes, our students are primarily attracted to Europe, uh, to English speaking countries, but Spain is very popular. Italy is very popular, Ireland, the UK, France, certainly, but they are beginning to branch out. We've had students in Asia, we've had students in Africa and Latin and South America. So that's, that's very exciting. And there you see the 100% of aid being portable or transferable. Life at PC, uh, never a dull moment. Oh, you know, tons of activities. Many of you know that we're a division one institution. So athletics play a role, a major role, a big role. Um, you know, uh, we're members of the Big East Conference. It's one of the top five or six conferences in the country. My son is a big part of, of athletics at, at Providence College. He's a member of the men's basketball team at PC. So he's had an incredible, incredible experience at Providence. Um, and you can see there's something for everyone. I mean, 120 clubs and organizations, there's something in all areas. Uh, campus ministry, you can see, serves as like an umbrella organization to several service-oriented organizations. You can see language and culture, media, publications, whether you're a writer, whether you're a musician, whether you're an artist, whether you're in theater, government, there's just something for everyone. They, you know, and if, if push comes to, to shove and you know, your son or daughter says, well, they don't have this. Well, they can start whatever that, that missing club is. They can get their friends, they can get 10 or 15 kids together and they can go to the board of programmers and start a club. They can start a club. Um, club sports are big. Rec intramurals are huge. I, I'm sure they were huge when you were at, at PC. And, and still, yes, there's that tradition of trying to get that, that intramural t-shirt that they value more than, I don't, you know, I, I can't even tell you the, you know, they value it at, uh, at, a, at the utmost, the highest rate possible. It's, it's bragging rights. It's, I got one. It's, they wear it for weeks on end without washing, apparently. Um, but it's, it is, intramurals are big. Our facilities are terrific. And, you know, we have lighted fields now, so they're playing at all hours of the day and night. So there's lots of opportunities. And here's some more opportunities uh, for involvement. A lot of our, you know, multicultural um, student organizations you can see here. The, um, the Board of Multicultural Student Affairs, Society of Organized Against Racism, Shepherd, Women Empowered, just so many opportunities to get involved. Dance, dance opportunities, um, there's something for everyone. Lots of initiatives around multicultural um, equity and inclusion. Um, we have placed uh, a, a premium on, on the word inclusion. I would, I would put that um, as the priority. You know, we've done, we've recruited, we've increased diversity exponentially. Almost 20% of our population is, is non-white. What we're working on is the inclusion portion of that. And we'll continue to do that. And Father Sicard is committed to working on inclusion and working on continuing to increase our diversity um, in all its forms at Providence College. So I'm very excited about it. In our strategic plan, we have a goal to get to 25% um, by the year 2028. Um, so yeah, it's, it continues to be a priority at Providence College. 
you're part of the 58,000 proud alumni here, the network that is so valuable to our current students. I know it's been incredibly valuable to my current senior as he's reached out to so many um, alumni who have given him informational interviews. He's a double major in finance and English. Um, and he'll be, well, he's co completing all of his requirements for both degrees by December, and he'll start some type of graduate program in the springtime. Um, so he's used the alumni network, which is not unusual. Many of our students um, cherish the opportunities to interact with, with our alumni. So thank you for, for speaking to all of our students. 96% of, of our 2019 graduates participated in an internship. What I would expand on this stat is, it used to be if you did one internship, you were doing great. Many of our students are doing multiple internships. I know my son has done two already. Um, he worked for an insurance company last summer. And this summer, uh, he worked in uh, wealth management. So yeah, he's had two different experiences. He, he's learned that he doesn't like insurance, but that's okay. That's, that's the whole point to doing an internship uh, and learning from the internship. Um, and so that's really important that students participate and take advantage of the opportunities and career services supports our students incredibly, uh, bringing multiple companies to campus every year. Um, I can't see what that stat says, but I'm sure it's a, I'm sure it's a good one. 96% of 2019 graduates were employed or in graduate school. I'm, I'm guessing that's what that first one says. Um, it's, it's what is traditional at, at Providence College, that our graduates are doing well, uh, and they continue to do well, um, both in finding employment directly related to what they studied and in finding uh, professional schools, medical schools, dental schools, law schools, uh, graduate schools, MBAs. Um, our students do very well after Providence College. There's a shot of, of Providence, uh, one of our, our former student um, ambassadors, Amy. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's just a, a knowing that where you are is exactly where you're meant to be. I think that is probably, you could put a lot of Friars pictures there. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a, a consistent sentiment. Uh, so we like the quote and we love the shot of, of Providence in the background. Danny is one of our, uh, one of the former Friars Club members, for those of you okay. who are Friars uh, in your time and his sister, is a uh, first year student at PC now as well. Um, and back um, after the January break last year, Danny was trying to decide, he had two different job offers that he was waiting between and among, not unlike a lot of the experiences of the seniors lately. Um, so he ended up, he's at Bain Capital. Love that, continuing the tradition. We have tons of legacy yeah. students, multiple students. And so that brings us to the major portion of of our conversation tonight, and that's the selection of students. But maybe, do we have a question in the in the chat? Maybe we should pause. I can, I can um I can throw your way. It was in regards to study abroad. Um, yeah. And I know that we're you know we're obviously continuing to assess the environment, but it was just uh, any insight on when study abroad or um, honors DWC trips can be. Um, might be coming back in the foreseeable future. Well, I hope it's next fall. We know it, it's not going to take place in the spring, but we're, we're really crossing our fingers that, that we can have students go abroad next, next fall. I mean, that's what we're shooting for. Um, Civ in London, uh, oh, faculty were, were dying to, to get that off the ground um, and, to, and to go to London this, this spring. Uh, but we're hoping that next fall we are um, as close to back to normal as we can possibly be. But we'll we'll take that one semester at a time at, at this point. 
So now I want to, you know, I want to talk about the admission process at Providence College because certainly that's why many of you are on the call, you know, on the Zoom or the webinar tonight is to learn about how our process um, might be a little bit different than other schools that your sons and daughters are looking at. Let me start by defining what legacy is at, at Providence College, because that's important. Um, we define legacy as the son or daughter of a parent who graduated from Providence College. So the parent is a legacy and sibling is a legacy. We, do, we, don't, we don't count, and not that they're not important, I don't wanna get all those, the hate mail telling me that, what do you mean my grandparents don't count? What do you mean my aunts and uncles don't count? Um, we count mother, father, brother, sister. That's what a legacy, the definition of legacy at Providence College is. It might be slightly different at other institutions, but here it's, it's mother, father. Um, this past year, just for some context, we received 10,000, um, 10,800 applications to Providence College, roughly. And we admitted 53, almost 54% of students after waitlist activity. Um, generally speaking, I would say that we're closer to about 50% for an admit rate. Um, we were slightly under for the class of 23. Um, we were about 48%. And this year, obviously, the pandemic certainly had some impact on, on us and enrollment, but we're, we're thrilled with the quality that we continue to attract. So it is a competitive process. It is a selective process. And so what do we value in this process when students submit their, their applications? You can see in that first circle, the strength of curriculum circle, that circle might be a little bit larger in my, in my world than maybe some other circles that we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Simply put, we want students who have challenged themselves in high school, who've taken advantage of the opportunities in high school, who've taken at the very least four years of English, four years of math, four years of science, are you noticing a trend? four years of history or social science, and wait for it, wait for it. Here's where I lose half of the room. Here's where people will start yelling in the chat. Four years of the same foreign language. I think we probably just lost half the room, but that's, that's okay, that's in the ideal. We understand there are things that students will make certain decisions based on interest. Um, that to me would be the ideal world, but we know sometimes um, students might get to a fourth year in their junior year or students might choose to double up in another academic subject because they want to take another science or they want to take another history or they want to take a social science. Um, and yes, we take all of those things into consideration. We go as far as rating a student's curriculum. Um, it's kind of what differentiates two students that look very similar from one another is their high school curriculum. We do that by um, a rating system. Um, and generally speaking, it's a zero to 10 scale, but you're starting at a five if you meet your minimum high school graduation requirements. So basically everybody is starting at a five, okay? The more honors the student has taken, the more APs perhaps, perhaps there are college courses that are offered through, through a local community college 
The International Baccalaureate Diploma Program is offered at many schools across the country. We, we will look at how the curriculum has, has, how the student has taken advantage of the curriculum that's been offered at his or her high school. We look at curriculum in the context of what, it, what is offered in the school. We don't penalize for things that are not offered. There are schools out there that don't offer calculus, that don't offer, believe it or not, a fourth year of a language, that don't offer you know, many electives in certain areas. So we're looking at the high school profile very carefully. And the thing that I should add is, you know, there are 17 members of the admission staff who all have a geographical territory. And they are honestly the experts on the schools in their, in their markets. They get to know the schools, they get to know the counselors, they know what's offered at the school and what the student could have taken. Um, a student could start in a complete college prep curriculum and then maybe takes, you know, I, t I talk to families about taking increased challenge in the areas of strength. If you're strong in math and science and you want to go into a science major, then perhaps seeing increased challenge honors AP in math and science. If you're stronger in the humanities, maybe the increase in challenge comes in English, history, and language. We, we want to see some increase in challenge. Perhaps it was straight college prep freshman year, one or two honors sophomore year, maybe two honors in an AP junior year, maybe a combination of you know, two and one or two and two in the senior year. Progression, academic strength of curriculum, progression over the four years. The grade point average, we don't take that at face value. Um, we recalculate every transcript. Every applicant's transcript is recalculated on an unweighted 4.0 scale. So we're looking at all 10,000 plus applications on a consistent grading basis. So we're looking at strength of curriculum and grade point average hand in hand, okay? Um, you can have a student who has taken the most challenging curriculum and, and has a 3.0 GPA that, will, that could do very, very well in our selection process. You could have a student who's taken a modest curriculum but has a 3.8 grade point average. The average GPA for an enrolled student at Providence College this year was a 3.47, 3.47. So it's a B plus to A minus average. A lot of that, and that's, you know, that's what we are consistently. We're gonna range from 3.45 to about a 3.51 uh, consistently. Um, but it's all relative to the student's curriculum. After we looked at, at the academic portion, the curriculum and the grade point average, we've recalculated it, we've, we've scored the curriculum. We now start to look at the subjective parts of the application. To us, probably the next most important thing are the essay questions, uh, the writing samples, and for Providence, there are two opportunities. There's the Common App essay that is required, okay? Uh, the essay prompts for the Common App, student selects one, and um, that's an opportunity. Obviously, we're liberal arts. Our goal when reading an essay is to learn as much as we possibly can about the student. Uh, you know, we've got staff who, do a wonderful job doing essay writing workshops across the country. Um, and we talk about essays that, that students write that are, that are great, they're well written, but you don't learn anything about the student. And those are, those are ones that I struggle with personally. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice essay, it's a good story, but I don't know much that I, you know, I didn't learn anything additional about the student. We 
also offer a supplemental optional, quote unquote optional. And we know we know optional is code for required in in admission speak. Um, while it's optional, I think of it as opportunity. I tell students, I tell families, it's an opportunity. A school is giving you an opportunity to provide additional information. To me, additional information means more information, better decision making. The more information we have, the better our decision can be. The thing about the, the supplemental essay questions is there, that they're institution specific. They take a little bit of research. They take a little bit more time. Um, selfishly speaking, it also gives us something different to read. We are reading thousands of these. Um, and so when we give you three options of, a t of an optional essay, we get something a little bit different each time. And that helps our sanity. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, you know, February could be a very long month of reading application after application after application after, you know, essay, the winning goal, the, you know, you've, if you've read, you know, 30 or 40 applications in a day, they, they start to meld together. The supplement gives us a little different spin um, and something that is so specific to Providence College. Um, extracurricular and leadership opportunities, qualities. Um, again, for me, it's what it's something else that we learn about the student. Um, I don't think about it as a laundry list. I don't really care about the quantity. We're looking at the depth of the involvement, the leadership, and what that student might potentially get involved with at Providence College. Students at Providence are involved. They're leaders. And we know students who are involved are successful in the classroom. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's going to be different for every student, but it's, we value that, that involvement. It's, you know, it could be athletics, it could be theater, dance, film. You saw the 120 clubs. So there's something for everybody. And we're looking for those opportunities uh, to get involved. Um, and so I think, again, that's, that's an opportunity. It's important. A lot of students, uh, my current senior in high school included, they don't realize how much they do on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't realize they, they've done way more than I ever did um, in high school. You know, three sport, athletes, service. It, it's just unbelievable um, the time they spent, the investment they make, not to mention part-time jobs, um, service, um, service to the church. I mean, it's, it's going to be different for every student. It's important that it be laid out nice, that we see everything that the student has done. Um, sometimes it's even nice to get a recommendation for, for one of those activities or, or for a service uh, commitment um, beyond uh, the teacher rec or the counselor rec. Those are opportunities, um, but it's not about the quantity, it's about the depth about what that student might contribute to our community. That's how I look at uh, the extracurricular activities. The next piece of the puzzle are those, those rec letters. And yes, we do read those letters of recommendation. The counselor letter is valuable. There's opportunities you know, that we can learn from, from a counselor rec and or an academic teacher or from um, you know, one of those activities or service people. Um, again, we wanna learn about the student. We hope that the people that they select to write on their behalf um, provide us another piece to this puzzle. And that is what it is. This is a puzzle that we're trying to put together so we understand who that person is and what they might bring to Providence College. And the last piece that I want to talk about, which has gotten enormous attention across the country this year, is testing. Um, 
you've seen a lot of colleges across the country become test optional or even test blind. I'm very happy that Providence College has been test optional for almost 15 years now. We didn't have to worry about changing our process because we've been test optional. We know the value that curriculum and grades and a three and a half year transcript is more important to us than what students provide in a standardized test. And it's been that way. I would say that we've been test optional even before we were test optional. You know, I'd say we've been test optional. It was never the driving force. It's always been about student performance. It's always been about, uh, you know, the academics more so than the SAT or the ACT. So, do we want to jump right into that or do we want to take some questions on the process? Application, selection, anything, Marie, that we, we should address now or? Yeah, you can, you know, you actually, uh, I let one question sit for a second because I knew okay. you were going to get to testing. So um, I've had the privilege of hearing this presentation once or twice. So I knew it was coming and I didn't want to steal your thunder before we got there. Yep. Um, can you talk maybe just a little bit, another question came through right after about um, any scholarship opportunities for continued yep. Catholic education for new students or sure. scholarships in general? Yeah, a a affordability is becoming... Uh, a major to topic for, for many students uh, and families. You know, we're an institution that's going to be $70,000 uh, tuition room and board next, next year for the class of 25. Um, and that's even difficult for me to, to say out loud. Um, what you need to understand is that, you know, our resources are limited, but we put the majority of our resources into need-based financial aid. We want to be as accessible to as many students as possible in our applicant pool. That's why we're trying to meet as high a percentage of need as we possibly can. And last year, we met on average 89% of a student's need. My dream scenario would be to meet 100% of student need. Uh, in the next eight years of our strategic plan. Um, but we do offer merit scholarships, okay? Admission to Providence College is selective. Getting a merit scholarship is that much more challenging, that much more competitive. Um, in the past few years, we've offered about uh, about 25% of our admitted students a merit scholarship. So roughly about 1,500 offers of merit scholarships. We're, in this environment, uh, we're going to increase that number to about 2,000 merit scholarship offers. Our highest award this year will be slightly over $30,000. It'll be 55% of tuition. This next highest will be 45% of tuition, and that'll be roughly $24,000, $25,000. And then the third scholarship, the Albertus Magnus Scholarship, will be a $20,000 a year scholarship. All of those scholarships are for four years, as long as you meet the academic, maintain the academic minimum grade point average of a 3.0. Um, and that's what's very, very important. We're, we want to make Providence College as accessible to as many families as possible. Uh, so you can see the average financial aid award was $33,700. Uh, and that was for this, this class of 2024. And 25% received a scholarship and the average scholarship was $18,120. So there's, there are opportunities. Just keep in mind, the average student that received a scholarship pretty much took the most challenging curriculum that his 
or her school offered and maintained above a 3.8 unweighted recalculated grade point average. So basically you walked on water and you parted the Red Sea. Um, it's, it's that competitive to get it. And while we're adding about 500 offers, the depth of our applicant pool probably won't even change the, the average numbers for our merit recipients. That's how deep. There are so many deserving, richly deserving, but we, we have to spread our dollars out over need-based aid. And we, we put you know, just a smaller amount into merit scholarships. So I'll pause there and hopefully there's a lot of questions brewing out there. I wish I could see faces, but I'm, I'm hopeful that you've got some questions that we can tackle. Yeah, Raul, I did, um, I did get one that just came through. Um, it goes back a little bit to recommendations. Um, yep. Somebody asked, is there a preference for how many? Um, and then just again, if you could go over from a little bit more about whom you're looking to get them from. Yeah, I think, I think the college counselor or the guidance counselor is a key recommender. Um, and I think one additional rec from an academic teacher is a great idea. Um, and I would limit it. I would go no more, probably no more than three. No more than three. Amy, do you want to add something to that? Is that, is that a good number? Oh, I think that's a good number. My rule of thumb when I'm talking to students too is, you know, six, six recommendation letters from six teachers who say that you're a great student isn't helpful. I think anything more than the counselor and one or two teachers, as you said, Raul, but what we tend to find really interesting or comes up in committee is when it's um, somebody who can add something different to your application. Did you do a service trip with someone? Is there a family that you've babysat for for a very long time? Um, you know, maybe you're really involved with church and your, your pastor writes something about you. That is what I think adds that texture to the file um, instead of another teacher letting us know that, you know, you're a rock star in the classroom. We can see that. Um, Agreed. Th those are more compelling, I think. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I did get a couple questions on the side, actually, through the chat. Um, yep. And one of them is about um, some of those deadlines. I think, mm -hmm. you know, we've got the early decision, we've got early yep. action. I don't know if you could take us through, um, you know. Yeah, let's, those let's, let's start at the beginning with those deadlines. Amy, you, can you put that slide back up? Um, November 1st is a big deadline uh, because it is the deadline for both early action There we go. November 1st is the deadline for both early action and ED1 early decision. Now, let's define early action. Early action is the most common early application deadline. Um, it's non-binding, meaning if you're admitted, you can wait until May the 1st, you can vet all the other institutions, you can compare financial aid awards, you can revisit the institutions and make your decision by May the 1st. Early decision is binding. Um, if you're admitted, and we will get those decisions out by November 15th, roughly, you will need to withdraw all other applications and enroll at Providence College by December 1st, roughly. It is a binding decision. When students raise their hand that they want to be at Providence College and they apply early decision, um, we take a higher percentage of those. Um, you know, we're probably close to 80% on the admit rate for ED1 and ED2. And we'll be probably roughly 50%, slightly lower than 50% for early action. And about, I don't know, 40% for regular decision. So you can see it's, it's certainly it's certainly a challenge for us because of when these applications are received. But ED is going, if, if Providence College is your number one choice, 
um, and you are not concerned about merit scholarships or need-based aid, then ED1 is your best opportunity. Let me say that again, is your best opportunity to gain admission to Providence College. But if you want to compare financial aid awards, if you want to go, you know, get those scholarships and see all the awards, then please don't apply early decision. You, you don't, you should apply early action. You should apply early action. That's what you should do. If you want to see everything, you want to compare to other places, great. Apply non-binding early action or regular decision for that matter, or regular decision, but not ED. Um, and so that's my, my little chat. Uh, I think regular decision, a lot of school, a lot of students probably should apply regular decision, but are, you know, for one reason or another, they apply early action. Uh, and in some cases, we want to see more information. We want to see senior performance. And when a student applies early action, we may have their first quarter grades, but we don't have their semester grades and we may end up deferring the decision to regular. In some cases, it may be best um, for a student to apply regular because it guarantees, it's the only process that guarantees that we will see first semester grades. Um, Carl, do you wanna mention about that cohort in the middle there between the admitted students from early action and the denied students from early action, the ones that we do need more information on? Yeah, you make a, a good point. I Sometimes when I say this, um, I get some backlash because, you know, we're an institution that makes the acceptance decision at early action. We defer students, okay? And here's the shocker. Here's the one where, I get all the phone calls. We actually deny students at early action if we don't feel that the semester grades would change any. We don't believe in carrying that student or, you know, carrying that student, giving that student false sense that there's a, a, a chance that they could get admitted at regular. Um, so there is a smaller number, but a number nonetheless that get denied at early action. Um, and some families will get frustrated with that because why didn't you defer? Why did, well, we didn't defer because with the information that we had, the student wasn't competitive in, an, in the applicant pool. Uh, and, you know, if they wanted to guarantee that, that's why I say in some cases they'd be best served by applying regular decision. If they've struggled freshman and sophomore year and all of a sudden they've improved junior year, that's the ideal regular decision candidate. Give yourself the most time to show the committee on admission that this is that your junior year is for real and you're going to sustain or even improve that uh, in your senior year. Your first half of your senior year is critically important. It's the equivalent of a full year, basically, uh, is the first semester. And we're looking at those grades and we're look, and we're certainly looking at the curriculum very, very closely for those students who, you know, for all students, but certainly for those students who apply early action where we might not have any grades. How did they challenge themselves? What are they taking? So the decision making there, I wish we could do this program. I've said it many times when I've done this in person. This program is great for freshmen and sophomores. I'd love to talk to freshmen and sophomores. Talk about the planning. Uh, talk about course selection for freshmen and sophomores, how they progress. Um, but when I've done this in person, most of the students who, are, who come to campus for the in-person program that we've done in the past were seniors, few juniors, few less sophomores, and very few freshmen. But it'd be great to talk to freshmen and sophomores about course selection and preparing for college and you know how to how to work hard and continue that progress over three and a half years four years awesome Ro, i'm going to pivot to another another question i got a couple more that came through uh the chat to me 
Um, so one of them was whether or not it's beneficial um, to go in with a declared major um, or into like applying to like the business school, for example, or to go in undeclared. Yeah, Marie, you, you touched on the one example that, you know, lately I've been, I used to, I used to carry the flag for undeclared. I was a big, be undeclared, explore, try different things. And I'm still, I'm still an advocate for it because I believe Nah, 80% of students are probably really undeclared. Um, but for the business school, it's getting tougher. It's, it's getting tougher to transfer into the business school. Um, it's the one area that I might say it could be more beneficial to say, hey, let me, let me start off as a, you know, I'm not sure which major, I'll, you know, I'll try management and finance. And if I, if I learn I like something else differently, I can always switch within the business school. But that's the one area I would say, yeah, declare, declare something in the, in the business school. Uh, outside of that, oh, go undeclared. Yes, try things, explore. You'll find something you truly want and like. Um, education, political science, the sciences. We are so strong in science. You know, for years, biology has been the single largest major at Providence College. Those kids go on to do amazing things. Our chemistry majors, you know, our biochem majors, the sciences are so strong at Providence. Um, but business is, is really big. It's closing in on almost 40% of our undergrads are in the business school. Um, so it's, it's gotten a little bit tougher, uh, certainly to switch from arts and sciences or professional studies into business. The other way around isn't as difficult if you want to go from, from business into arts and sciences or professional studies. I think they'd, they'd welcome you with open arms. Um, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a challenge at all. Um, and that's the great thing about Providence. You know, our core curriculum, while, while a lot of people talk about CIV, there's still a lot of flexibility in our curriculum. I mean, I, I think of my own son, I, you know, I was shocked, shocked when he said, I'm double majoring in English. I mean, I might have picked 39 other majors before I, got to, before I got to English, but it's been tremendous. It's been great, finance and English. Who would have thought? Uh, it's, you know, it's really preparing him. It's great. Two other questions I've been getting a lot from high school students or parents, Marie, I don't know if this is helpful um, for some of the families out there is in general when applying to colleges right now, we are, by the way, all looking at um, what your schools did or what your, your sons and daughters schools have done this past year in terms of pivoting online. We know that it is wide and varied um, from, from school districts and school systems that were given students just independent work to complete and submit at some point. Um, some schools stopped grading at third quarter um, and somewhere in March and just had the students, you know, complete certain tasks on a pass fail basis. Um, in some ways, I feel like saying, you know, we're going to see it all this year and we're going to um, accept what the schools are giving us. I mean, I don't think as as parents, as guardians, that's something to be really concerned about as long as the students have been doing their best work possible um, in their circumstances. And a lot of the high schools, I know a lot of the high school counselors have been reaching out to us from our various areas to, to say, how should we explain this to you? And some of them are doing it in recommendation letters. Some of them are sending a little disclaimer along with the transcript. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And if you're concerned, just ask your counselor, how are you explaining it to, to the colleges? And our colleagues at other colleges are talking about this too, right, Raul? We're on listservs yeah, with colleges all over, from Ivy's right down to open enrollment I'm places. I'm glad you brought it up. It's a great um, point. It's one and less thing as families to think about. Don't, don't worry about that. We, yeah. we, we're we're going to be very understanding, um, you know, High schools went through the same thing that Providence College went through and, you know, 3,000 other colleges across the country went through. So we're, mm -hmm. we're going to be understanding. We'll, we'll recalculate on things that we do have um, and not, you know, not worry about the pass-fail areas. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, from someone about a Catholic or diocesan scholarship yeah scholarship um we don't offer that that type of 
scholarship. I know Catholic colleges out there that do. Uh, you know, uh, it's you, you're seeing it a bit more. I certainly there's somebody out there, man, who has twins. God bless you. Uh, I have twins <laughs> that are seniors, boy and a girl that are both interested in PC. Tell them to get three jobs next summer. Uh, no, <laughs> <clears throat> um, no. Unfortunately, we we don't uh, we don't have a diocesan or just a you know because a student attended a Catholic school scholarships like like that. What we have are the academic scholarship merit scholarships, um, and everything else would would be need based. That's right. That's right. There's a question to roll about, um, does PC have ABET accredited engineering program? Um, and then about the pre-med track with engineering. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about the engineering because, you know, that's a unique, a unique program that, that we have. It's, it's called a three plus two engineering program. And we have two joint agreements, one with Columbia university, and one with Washington University in St. Louis. And really this program um, is designed for the student who wants more than just the engineering. They want the foundation of a liberal arts, the combination of liberal arts with the math, science, engineering foundation. And basically the student comes and is an applied physics student, applied physics major or a physics major at Providence College. And they're fulfilling all prerequisites for direct entry into an engineering program of their choice at either Columbia or Wash U. Now, what has happened in many cases over the past years is, you know, they they come to Providence College, they they drink the Friar Kool-Aid, they bink, they become friars, and they end up graduating from Providence College in four years with a physics degree and then applying for a master's in engineering at an engineering program in the future. That's certainly a possibility, but I'm also, you know, there are plenty of engineering programs out there that are four-year engineering programs undergraduate that are opportunities to look at. Our engineering is, is a little bit unique. Both Columbia and WashU have joint agreements with several institutions similar to Providence College, liberal arts types of places um, that give that, that student the balance that they're, they're looking for beyond just being an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer, uh, civil engineer. But those opportunities are exist. And, and honestly, the two schools are among the best in the country in engineering. I mean, you know, Columbia and Wash U are top tier engineering schools. So they're an opportunity. And basically, if the student for Wash U maintains a 3.33 or better at Providence College, they can get direct entry. Columbia is, they have to, it's, it's an application. It's not guaranteed, but they're very, they're very generous. Um, but that's, that for that school, you probably have to be a 3.5 or better. Um, but they, you know, we've had the agreement for, you know, for several years, probably 20 years. It was here when, when I got here in 2000. So the agreements have been in place for a long time. Um, and they were just renewed uh, maybe a year or two ago. Um, so they're still very much in place. And it's another, another way of approaching an engineering degree. Awesome. Well, I'm actually going to jump in because I, I got a question. Um, I know we're also, we're already at eight o'clock time flies. Yep. We're having fun, well, but, um, asking about um, interviews. I know a lot of people ask about that. So just what are the possibilities for interviews this year? Um, in terms of Yeah, all of, you know, all of our programming has, has gone to virtual. Um, you know, we were starting to bring small visit opportunities to campus. We were having small tours, but you know, we've recently shut everything down. Uh, safety is the utmost priority. Um, we are we are doing virtual interviews every single day of the week, and maybe Amy can give you more on the the scheduling of them. She knows it better than than I do, but they're pretty. I mean, we've 
got plenty of opportunities out there. And, and if you've got something that you want to learn specifically or you want to share, um, that's what an interview is for, is to really share that information. But, you know, we've got several slots every day, right? Oh, gosh, we have. So there are three people, um, two or three people available um, pretty much every hour. Every, every hour? From nine to, I think there's um, six... Some days it's five slots with three people each yep. and some days it's six slots with three people each right. and Saturday mornings as well. Um, nine, 10 and 11 AM. Um, a lot of the interviews, and excuse me if you already said this, Raul, um, are actually done with our senior admission fellows. So they're interns who've been trained. Right. Um, in a normal year, all of us admissions folks are out on the road traveling around the world. Right. Um, so they, they're home, <laughs> they're staffing the office for us and they're, um, They've worked with us, several of us um, associate deans have been working with them for, for weeks doing mock interviews. They've had to interview high school versions of ourselves uh, to make sure they, they're doing it right. And they are incredible advocates for the school um, and they, they certainly know their stuff. Um, and please know they're not evaluative interviews. Um, and by that we mean it's not going to um, raise a student's uh, chance of admission if they have one. Mm -hmm. um, it's really just a chance for the student to get more information about themselves and to become an informed applicant, um, just like all the other virtual programs that we're offering right now for, for juniors, at, um, and juniors and seniors, I should say. Um, note that the interviews are just for seniors. Um, and they should really be done before, um, try for before November 1st, mm -hmm. even if the student isn't applying until January, um, because we only offer them till about Thanksgiving. So. What else you got, Marie? I do have somebody, I think this is a bit of a, um, in addition to the engineering, are there any programs, um, I know you can speak to, like for nursing or med school where there's four plus one options for anything else, or is that more of just in the engineering world? Yeah, I mean, we have the Simmons program, um, but that's, that's post undergraduate degree. So the student has to complete their undergraduate degree generally in, in the sciences. And um, I think it's a three year program through Simmons to get a nursing degree. I have, Amy, do you have that, that joint agreement? I don't because that was under, it was under review. So I don't know. Um, they were changing the Simmons the, program. The specific, yeah. They were changing the specifics of it. So that's why if we sound like we're being a little um, <laughs> unsure of it, um, we admit for any of these programs, I think the important piece is we admit to PC. There's right. no automatic entry for any right. of the programs. Um, and I, that's a big difference between I think us and some programs people might be thinking of. I saw someone ask about the pre-med placement right. rate. And I guess this is a good opportunity to talk about our pre-allied health um, advising program, because I think that's what helps prepare students for, you know, professional programs in medical school, dental school, uh, veterinary school, nursing school, PT, OT. I think the fact that we have a committee of faculty who are working with these students as undergrads, starting with their freshman year, advising them mm -hmm. if they're thinking about going to a professional school, helps our placement when they are applying in, you know, in their junior year to get into medical school, dental school, vet school, nursing school. It's why we have a strong track record in placing students who get the recommendation of this committee. They get a joint recommendation from this allied health committee, and that's what helps our placement record. Uh, Percentage-wise, yeah, it's, it's very strong. It's close to 90% of students who get the recommendation um, from this committee who are getting into these professional, professional programs. Um, but, you know, students are going through a very rigorous application process. They're sitting for uh, standardized tests, which they have to take for medical school and dental school and all things. And this committee will help them with the interview process. This committee will help them with testing, get them support if they, if they need it. And they'll know them well to write their letter of recommendation 
and they'll match them with institutions that they are applying to. I think that's what's really important about preparing students for professional programs from Providence. Anything else out there, Marie, that we haven't covered? I think you've pretty much hit right. everything. I think you, you nailed it. Um, I mean, I don't know if either of you have any last closing thoughts. Um, like I said, I think the great thing is that we're also gonna be able to share this with all of our guests that were on this call. Um, and I know we're already getting some, some folks that are really grateful for your presentation. So um, I don't know, Raul and Amy, any, any last thoughts? I'm just very thankful to you guys and to our group for, for being here tonight. I just wanna thank everyone for, for staying on the line for, <laughs> for an hour to listen to listen yeah. to this because I know everybody is busy and everyone yeah. is, um, you know, has their, their own jobs and they're Zooming left and right. And so I'm so appreciative of the time of our alums spending with us tonight. I, you know, I thank you, Marie and Amy, for, for setting all this up. Um, you know, it's, it's just a, an opportunity. We, we really appreciate the, the alums uh, and we want students of alums to apply to Providence College. That's something that, I, you know, I can't say enough. Um, we get so many um, and, and they're great fits for Providence. They've heard stories about Providence College for years. Um, and we love to continue that tradition. We love it to continue that tradition. And you all are um, an extension of our office and that you're ambassadors of the college. I mean, you know, the number of places we go and, and people say my teacher is, a, you know, a, an alum or my neighbor's an alum or whatever it is. So thank you for that, too, because you, you sort of lay the groundwork. So when we get there to do the presentations, um, people know happy people. Went to yeah, PC. Exactly. It's great. <laughs> Airports, it's great. the beach, the beach, <laughs> show up at the beach with a baseball cap and you're going to you're going to find an alum. Um, I actually met two alums kayaking on Cape Cod this summer. Um, it was a, it was a great conversation that highly annoyed my six year old, but that's another story. So fires are everywhere. Just Pardon. wear that gear, and we'll we'll yes. find each other. You yes. sure do, Absolutely. Marie. Thank you so much. Thank, so, Rowan, you. thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, you're both fantastic. So very grateful, and uh, as always, go Friars. Good luck, thank everyone. You. Good luck to all your students applying this year. Have a great thank year. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Bye.